Welcome to the December 3rd edition of the Downers Grove Village Council meeting. We're glad you've joined us tonight. If you're in council chambers on either side of the room, there are agendas which will keep you following along with tonight's program. If you're at home watching, on the lower left-hand corner of our website, you'll see a link for this week's meetings. Those same materials are available there. Um, we start our meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance, and tonight we have some help from uh, PAC 57, Downers Grove Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts. If you guys would come on up and help us. All right, guys, the flag is on your left. Look over here to your left. Face the flag, and we'll start in. Ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, guys. Appreciate the help. You can go ahead and head back to your seats. <coughs> If you haven't seen that before, we uh, several times a year we'll have a visit from scouts and, and it's pretty neat to see these kids wanting to learn a little bit about their local government. So thanks for coming tonight, guys, and thanks for the help on that. April, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Gray? Here. Commissioner Colvane? Here. Commissioner Sadowski? Commissioner Wallace? Here. Commissioner Earl? Here. Commissioner Jose? Here. Mayor Barnett? Here. Thank you. First uh, item on tonight's list is the minutes of previous council meetings we have to approve. Mayor, I move that the council adopt the minutes of November 19, 2019 as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any comments? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. This takes us right up to our public comments portion of our meeting. We have several opportunities for public comments. Um, the first is right now, and this can be on any subject that is not on tonight's agenda. If you've come this evening and want to bring something up to us or mention something uh, that's not on tonight's agenda, please step forward to the podium and let us know what's on your mind. Please, come on down. Uh, David Rose, and as you might guess, I have some additional remarks about environmental sustainability. In thinking further about Commissioner Jose's reply to my remarks on the 12th of November, hearing him list achievements as other members of council have done in response to my questions and comments, I wanted to elaborate on my realization that the difference between your sense of what you are doing and my assertion of what you should be doing is grounded in different interpretations of the word sustainable. Specifically, I contend what you are doing should be characterized not as stewarding environmental sustainability, but rather as environmental protection or environmental enhancement or environmental improvement. Unfortunately, when talking about the environment in a political economic context, the word sustainable has come to mean enhance and protect as in being environmentally sensitive, <clears throat> as in less harmful, more friendly to nature than one has been in the past, as in less polluting, more efficient, as in more recycling, less wasteful, and especially less energy, or excuse me, more energy efficient, to name a few of the more common notions. This loose interpretation is how the village officials use sustainable, <laughs> as do almost all people, governments, businesses, and the media. Even those within the environmental movement tend to use the word this way. I contended in the material I submitted to you that if one is truly serious about the issue of environmental sustainability, one must address the question, is economic growth environmentally sustainable? Thinking about it further, I realize this question likely makes little sense, at least in the way I intended, to those who use the loose definition. So I first thought rephrasing the question specific to Downers Grove might help clarify. If our present way of life is not environmentally sustainable, as I contend, and if we remain committed to economic growth, which is an article of faith among government and business leaders, what does growth look like that results in our way of life becoming environmentally sustainable? But then I realized even this rephrasing likely does not make sense if one holds to the loose definition of sustainable. 
permit me to try to illustrate the difference in meaning and the thrust of my question by discussing achievements. Using the loose notion of protect and enhance, one might expect to see the council encourage green businesses, whatever officials might think that means, or green practices by existing businesses, whatever that means. It might also encourage, perhaps even demand, developers and new businesses use green products in their projects, whatever that might mean, and adjust its own practices in that regard. Indeed, members of the council consistently refer to these sorts of things in replying to my comments. On November 12th, numerous village residents enunciated multiple other steps and ideas the council should consider. From the council's perspective, these are likely seen arising from a potentially unending set of such requests. So the question is, how does the council decide what to do and what not to do? Under the loose definition, any decision it makes to do something is an achievement. Why doesn't it do more? Because under the loose definition, there is no reason to. There is no particular motivation to, especially given financial constraints. One presumes one is doing as much as one can, as much as one needs to do, balancing this objective against others. And most importantly, one takes into account the reaction any step is likely to generate among voters. Absent voter mobilization, unless a council member is particularly committed to the matter and takes it upon him or herself to enlist the support of fellow council members, little or nothing is done about it. Under the customary but more demanding meaning of the word sustainable, on the other hand, applied in this context does the quality and condition of the relationship between ourselves and our environment, achievements are relative to targets. A reduction of some kind, for example, would be relative to a desired long-term rate of reduction to reach a desired, excuse me, to reach a target and long-term <coughs> outcome over a predetermined time frame. The Paris Climate Accord's goal of worldwide reduction of carbon dioxide emissions is a readily available example of the concept. For each factor being addressed, the target amount would be operational, not solely for the village bureaucracy as an organization, but for the village as a whole. <laughs> Given that understanding, the council, in conjunction with other taxing bodies and supported by a concerned citizenry, would have established targets across a variety of factors. Background information would explain how each factor was chosen and how each target was determined to be a verifiably sustainable one, contributing to the sustainability of the whole, the village's way of life. Summary reports of village efforts would have been required by ordinance, have been produced at regular time intervals, and been available for review and analysis by residents of the village for information and confirmation of the village's activities, and to guide and motivate residents' own individual and collective efforts. All of these would have fallen under the jurisdiction and responsibility of the head of the village's Department of Environmental Sustainability, a department and position the council would have created to lead and coordinate its efforts. The community's co commitment to the effort would have been further facilitated by the public-private partnership between village government and the village's Sustainable Environment Development Corporation. The SEDC would have been populated by members of the village representing its various profit and nonprofit organizations, along with interested, motivated, knowledgeable individuals representing the community as a whole. The, count, the corporation would have been operating independently of and in cooperation with village government to promote environmental sustainability within the community and with entities that interface with the community's residents and organizations. If the village retained a separate economic development corporation, the two development bodies would likely have needed to partially overlap in leadership to ensure proposed economic development projects were compatible with and advance the village's effort to attain environmental sustainability. Hey, David, are we, are we close? It, it's, I'm going to be real, yeah. I'm be real honest All with right. you about something. I'll, Hang on one second. What you're saying is, is interesting and certainly worth thought, but the truth of the matter is that in this setting, it's really hard for us to even follow because it gets so it's so long and it would be we would be way more able to process and digest what you're talking about if it were written all right so we I, we, we try to keep everybody limited on time but in, in your particular case with this issue i don't think it's a real effective way to try and convey to us what's going on can i go ahead yeah finish please go ahead a little bit then. yep i'll there are other points i could have described here sure and then, please do. Please send that to us. Let me just continue this way then. 
none of what I was describing happened. And my working hypothesis, as I suggested, is that it didn't happen because of the loose definition. Why? Well, let me, a couple more minutes, if I may, and I take your point, and I won't do this again. <laughs> Thinking about the situation further, I realize the difference between my understanding and the council's may also rest in the assessment of the current condition. I contend the village has no idea how far away from being environmentally sustainable its way of life is. Village leaders seem not to find such lack of information worrisome. And I wonder why could that be the case? I arrived at the notion that it's one of two reasons. Either thanks to their holding the loose definition, council members do not see the objective as an indicator, or they do understand it this way but assume the relationship is okay. And that leads in turn to this point. Why might they believe so? Because they believe the village is doing at least as well or better than everyone else. As Commissioner Jose and others point out, we're winning awards. But my contention is that not only is the way of life in Downers Grove unsustainable, the American way of life is unsustainable, which is to say unsustainable appears normal rather than alarming because it's all around us. And I'll finish on this point. The 2019 report just released by the United Nations of the so-called emissions gap affirms this state of affairs. The report is available online. The gap is the difference between the annual amount of CO2 actually being released and the increasingly smaller amount of worldwide emissions that should be released annually by 2030 in order to reach the goal of avoiding temperature rise worldwide of more than 1.5 degrees centigrade by the end of the century. Why is this a gap? Why is there a gap? Because the Paris Agreement of 2015, which at the time was hailed as a great achievement, adopted, to use my characterization, a loose definition rather than a strict definition. It defined rates of reduction that were ostensibly strict, but in practice were loose because they were voluntary with no enforcement mechanisms for any nation missing its commitment, which means if one wished to be politely sarcastic, Downers Grove is in good company. And this is the final point, if I may. The United States, according to the report, is, let me, let me try to condense this here. Its per capita emissions are twice those of the EU and China, the next highest per capita emitters which suggests, I would assert, why our president plans to withdraw the U.S. from the agreement. <coughs> I wonder how long it will take before we have the question, how much worse will the quality of the relationship get before politically acceptable and environmentally necessary coincide? Thank you for your attention. Thank you, and, and I hate cutting you off because it's important, so please circulate that to us. Uh, we do try and keep folks to five minutes um, for some obvious reasons. There's a room full of people. If everybody took five minutes, we, we wouldn't get any business accomplished. And the other side of that is true, too, that, that as a group, we are trying very hard to, to take this information in and process it internally, and that can be tough in, in some settings where there's no sort of advance warning or, or something to follow. So does anybody else have something not on tonight's <coughs> agenda? Please come up to the podium. Uh, Christine Martin. I would like just to make comment that I drive over the tracks numerous times a day on Maple going east towards Fairview. So I'm not talking the tracks at Fairview. I'm talking the tracks that go Maple over past towards the gas station at Fairview. When you're driving east, it's just something I've noticed and I wouldn't want anything to happen. I feel that when they did the construction at the train tracks that the asphalt to the left, so west, is quite far, and I feel like there's plenty of room there. But on the east side, it looks shorter, and every time I go, I always think, if somebody, even with bad weather, if somebody slid, they're going to be locked in there. And so I did call the city one day, and I didn't know who to talk to because <coughs> the, um, you have to press the buttons. And so I wasn't quite sure, so I just thought I'd say it now. Um, I, I assume you, you would, it has to do with the train um, company, the, the rail company, but I just thought it should be looked at. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, would you 
give some information to the guy sitting at the end of the table there so we can circle back around and maybe really clearly understand what it is. Yeah, okay. I will. It's just something Please, that knows. I just don't yeah. think there's so much space there. Sure. Just give your information to Mike there and, and then he can track down some details. Anybody else? Please come on up. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Preston Stroud. I'm from Village Square Three Condos. I've been here several times. It won't take up a lot of your time tonight. Uh, I'm here tonight. I've asked you to take a look at things, and so I'm here just to drop off some copies of why I think the issue that I've tried to bring to your attention should be looked at. Um, and that's all I want to say. I'm hoping that you'll take a look at it, maybe put it on your agenda, um, and, and maybe work with us on it. Um, so I'm just kind of looking for it kind of a yes or a no, even if you were to consider uh, maybe talking about it in executive session. We'll, uh, we'll read through that next. I, I don't know what's appropriate, but like I said, I don't want to take up a lot of your time. It looks like you have a full house, and I just wanted to present that to you for consideration. And we okay. will def we'll definitely read through it. All right, thank you so thank you. much. Have a good night. You too. Good evening. Can you hear me? Uh, Steve Jagailo, 4908 Highland, 4913 Maine. I just wanted to offer some comments and clarifications based on the uh, uh, November 19th meeting. Um, I sent an email to the Village Council on the 23rd of November. Uh, my only reply was from Commissioner Sadowski Fugit. Um, she's not here today. So um, I just wanted to point out something in the response, uh, and I'll quote. We had not, until you spoke at the meeting, heard any opposition to this. And my opposition was to option three of the SSA, uh, the new SSA two. And so I just wanted to say, for the record, the commercial property owners have been following the future of downtown draft plan since its inception. And we've been doing it via video <coughs> and the documents that have been online um, on the website. We became visible uh, when a meeting that occurred on 9-23-19, uh, Mike Baker mentioned that there was an option to remove the residential property owners from the new SSA. Then on 10-1-19, I came in front of the village council and I spoke against this. Now you may not remember that because there was such a volume of comments about cannabis. So I might have been lost in the, in the wake of that. But then again, I spoke uh, at the DMC board meeting on October 3rd, and I also spoke against this at the, commu uh, the commercial property owners meeting with Mike Baker on October 23rd, 19. So I just wanted to make sure that you knew that we're not late to the party. We've been there the whole time, but we don't get involved until uh, there's a need to be. That meeting with Mike Baker on October 28th ultimately resulted in the DMC board unanimously recommending um, that, uh, and you know what the recommendation is. Uh, this leads me to the next clarification. Uh, Mayor Barnett and I had a little bit of a disagreement in terms of the addition of landscaping and beautification to that recommendation. Um, I didn't dispute that that had been discussed in the past. My dispute was that it was not part of the recommendation. And so he said he'd have somebody investigate that. Um, Mayor, I took it upon myself and I investigated it. I'd like to, I'll just give this to Mike Baker. Uh, this is page two um, of a document that was handed out here at the village meeting on the 19th of November uh, for the future downtown draft plan. And what I did was I just highlighted the part that shows what the recommendation was. Also at that uh, November 19th meeting, uh, Commissioners Kulavani and Jose stated that they have either received emails or have heard from residents within the SSA that are willing to pay some of their proportionate share. 
So the commercial property owners would like the residential property owners to contribute to the downtown instead of the burden being placed on only 171 commercial property owners. That is why we asked if the Village Council would consider a separate SSA for landscaping and beautification funded entirely by the residential property owners. Now the proposed $100,000 divided by over 400 residential property owners would just be a fraction of what they're paying into the SSA now. Also, it would not, it would alleviate another $100,000 on top of what the commercial property owners are already paying to fund the DMC budget. Also, um, this would give, you could have a separate board for the residential property owners and that would give them a voice to work with the village regarding beautification and landscaping. And it would show the commercial property owners that the village council is making an attempt to be fair, to do what's right. After all, the residential property owners purchased a condominium or townhome based on location so that they can enjoy the benefits of living in downtown Downers Grove. Now, thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Steve. We're, uh, you, what you're talking about makes a lot of sense, but we're, please know we're working right now through the downtown management as an organization. And so we have to be pretty specific and pretty deliberate about we and, and how we is defined. And when we says something, who exactly we is and who's got you know, authority to speak for others. And, and so uh, we'll consider that and talk some more about it. But just please know that that's the, the process is very deliberately working through the downtown management corporation right now. Okay, thank you. Because sometimes communication through email <laughs> loses a lot. And uh, I just appreciate the time. Thank sure, you. Sure, thank you. Anyone else? Subjects not on tonight's agenda? Good evening, everybody. Y'all know who I am. My name is Francis Cerisi, 30 year resident of Dallas Grove. This is Jester. Before I tell you what I came to speak, I want to speak to the first man that came up. Take your time. <clears throat> Earth is going to die in 11 years. There is no planet B. Now, as to my issue, which you're all familiar with, Your Honor, as per our last conversation, you mentioned that you were going to be discussing this issue. And as per usual, I just want to say my side. Since the very beginning of this issue in 2017, I have worked in numerous ways to bring down the amount of uh, discomfort Jester brings. People have told me, yeah, you've done all that, but he still barks. Well, if you go from a volume 10 on your stereo to a one or a two, that's a serious reduction. To show you what I've done, we started with this good little stuff. It's called Rescue Remedy. It's an herbal treatment. Think of it as herbal LSD. It's, it's real nice stuff. Started with this. Maybe you've heard of the pet industry company called Chewy. Um, they have a big selection of products. First thing I started with from them was this, Dr. Lyon's Calming Aid, and it works very nice. The problem with this is it's 14 bucks, and everybody buys the stuff, and it's never available. My issue. Secondly, I went to these Calming Bites, which is 40 bucks a bottle, and they're available, or 40 bucks a container. They're available, and we use these to this day. I even have from my veterinarian Doggy Prozac. Okay, there's medications A, B, and C so far. Actually, A, B, C, and D. I bought him an electronic zapping collar for barking. 
Don't ask me why, but that didn't work. I had it on him, and my wife hit the button, and nothing happened. I, with my full weight and body, I laid on him, on the collar, and my wife hit the button, and nothing happened. As I was taking it off, she hit the test button and zapped me pretty seriously. Don't ask me how come I got the zap and not the dog. I bought him one of these. This is a citrus uh, spray collar that sprays when he barks. And this actually worked relatively well until, unfortunately, he decided he liked the citrus. So he has pretty much um, made our house smell like this. But it works. The last step I have, this is called a thunder shirt. It wraps around the dog and it gets nice and snug and it's a calming aid. This is 50 bucks. Back to my point, I want to show, since you're having these discussions, I believe, maybe you can see how much effort I've put in to solving this issue. Is the effort equated to a complete, total, no barking ever? No. But like I said, take your stereo from volume 10 down to volume 1 or 2. That's how much I've gone through so far. I don't know what has happened lately in the court system, but all the people who were nice to me have now treated me like I'm a leper. Actually, they treat me even worse than a leper. And I have a court date coming up that I will have to miss another day's work at $170. That's day number five. You can do the math. Five days at $170 to fix this. And my point is, I know that my neighbor has rights to peace and quiet. And if, my, if any of these instances happened at 2 in the morning, I'd pay right up. They're all in the middle of the afternoon. Do I not have the right to have a dog? That's my point. I don't know. I, I wish that what I showed you might just mean something. And now, since I'm not in that emotional mood, the Earth is going to die in 11 years. There is no planet B. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Francis. Anybody else with subjects not on tonight's agenda? Okay, there'll be two more opportunities for public comment, um, both at the first reading and active agenda points in the meeting. We'll take up individual subjects. Um, before we go on to the, we have a public hearing tonight. Before we go on to that, I have a proclamation I'd like to read. Today's Giving Tuesday. I think probably most people know that it's pretty hard to not be aware of that, uh, but it's a good thing for us to touch base with uh, and, and highlight for everyone. Um, we spend a lot of time, of course, with Thanksgiving, and then we have Black Friday, and then we have Cyber Monday, and there's a lot of focus on, on ourselves during that time, and, and so Giving Tuesday appropriately tries to refocus us a little bit. Whereas Giving Tuesday was established as a national day of giving on the Tuesday following Thanksgiving, and whereas Giving Tuesday is a celebration of philanthropy and volunteerism when residents across Downers Grove, DuPage County, Illinois, and the country give whatever they can to organizations and causes that are meaningful to them. Whereas Giving Tuesday is a day when citizens work together to share commitments, rally for impactful organizations, work to build a stronger community, think of others, and give back to their community. And whereas on Giving Tuesday and throughout the year, it is important to recognize the tremendous impact that philanthropy, volunteerism, and community service make on our community and the lives of our residents. Whereas Giving Tuesday is an opportunity to encourage all businesses and residents of Downers Grove to serve others throughout the holiday season and to take this time to dedicate themselves to service throughout the year. Now therefore, I, Robert T. Barnett, Mayor of Downers Grove, do hereby proclaim December 3rd, 2019 as Giving Tuesday Day in the Village of Downers Grove and encourage all citizens to join the movement and celebrate together in giving back to the community in ways personally meaningful to them. Dated this third day of December, 2019, at Downers Grove, Illinois. And with that, we will move on to item five on our agenda tonight. We have a public hearing. I find my notes. Thank you. 
Okay, we'll first start by calling this meeting to order. The public hearing has been called by the Village Council pursuant to the Illinois Truth in Taxation Law to consider the proposed 2019 tax levy for the Village of Donners Grove. Notice of this hearing was published in Enterprise Newspapers, Inc., otherwise known as The Bugle, on November 20th, 2019, and a copy of the notice and proof of the publication have been presented and are made an official part of the record of this hearing. I'd like to summarize the procedures we'll follow tonight for the public hearing. First, I'll ask the village manager to summarize the proposed 2019 tax levies. I'll then ask any member of the village council wishes to make a statement or ask a question. There will then be an opportunity for members of the public to make statements, comments, or to submit written questions or comments for the record. I will then ask any member of the council if they wish to make a statement or ask additional questions. Thereafter, the hearing will be adjourned. At this hearing, witnesses will not be sworn, and a verbatim written transcript of the statements or testimony given at the hearing will not be prepared. With that, Dave. Thank you, Mayor Barnett. Uh, we do this uh, public hearing on the tax levy every year, and in keeping with our tradition, I will hand it over to Deputy Village Manager Mike Baker, who will present information on the property tax levy. Thank you, Dave. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. This hearing is the continuation of a process that has included several public meetings since the village budget was released in October. The village council is scheduled to adopt the property tax levy and abate certain uh, debt levies at its meeting on December 10th. Now let me take just a minute or two to explain a little further what the process of levying and abating taxes actually means. There's a table that appears in the staff report on this item and it provides a useful illustration. And the items that are required to be levied by the village are shown in the middle column. Um, the first five rows represent the village portion of the tax levy that we've been discussing regularly as part of the budget review process. The figures that appear under the debt service category in total about $9.7 million reflect general obligation or GO bond payments that the village will make in 2020. GO bonds pledge the taxing authority of the village in order to secure lower interest rates. However, the abatement process provides a means for those amounts to be removed or abated if other revenue sources are available to make these payments. For the village of Downers Grove, all of them have alternative revenue sources such as TIF revenues, stormwater fees, and other revenues, which means that general property taxes are not required to be used. Therefore, following the abatement process, the column of figures on the right will reflect the village property taxes to be applied to the taxable property across the village of Downers Grove. And that, those figures total just over $14.6 million dollars uh, which is here, and that is the same number that appears in a table uh, that we've been seeing regularly at meetings and is published in the budget document. So again, just wanted to provide a little of that explanation. Um, when we look at the village portion of the tax bill compared to the all other taxing bodies, the village is shown in orange and represents just under 10% of the overall tax bill. For the typical residents in Downers Grove with a market value of approximately $300,000, the amount of taxes paid to the village of Downers Grove in 2020 will be $579, an increase of $32.79 from the amount paid in 2019. That concludes my presentation. Just a quick note, Mayor, you'll also see in the materials that appear elsewhere on the agenda, there are some levies for special service areas, and there are many of them, but only two of them are active. One is the special service area for the downtown. It's the same levy amount we've been levying for many, many years, and it is not subject to the changes that Dr. Jagaila was just talking about, or we've been talking about the last couple of months. That actually will come forward in a couple of years. Um, and the other one is um, a levy that actually is a tax on an area that is outside of the village of Towers Grove for which the village provides fire protection and EMS services. 
So we just wanted to clarify that. All of the other SSAs, we are actively levying zero as required under county procedures to make sure that those SSAs remain active should we ever need to levy taxes only in the event that private owners fail to maintain stormwater management facilities and we would have to step in. And those taxes would only apply to the properties that benefit from those stormwater enhancements. So with that, we gave the extended version of the public hearing of taxes this year. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dave. Any members of the council have questions, comments to make? Okay. All right. Anybody from the audience want to question, ask questions or make comments about what you just heard? Everybody's excited about the tax levy. Awesome. Fantastic. All right. Circling back around. Just to thank you to staff for the extended version. Thank you. The ex explanation for everyone. Thank you. Anyone else from the Village Council? Rich? Uh, thank you for your thoughtful work in uh, answering all these questions. Uh, these can be found in our, our uh, normal spot on the website. Yes, the Council had asked many other questions related not only to the property tax levy, but the budget, and Commissioner Colvaney is referring to under the agenda materials. <coughs> on our website, if you click on Council Responses, you'll see all the budget responses, questions, and all the tax levy questions. Thank you. For sure. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Rich. Okay, with that, we'll call this public hearing adjourned. We'll continue on with the consent agenda. <coughs> Is there a motion for the consent agenda? Mayor Barnett, I move that the council adopt the consent agenda as presented. Second. Any comments from Village Council? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to our active agenda. We have one active agenda item tonight. Uh, we will introduce that item, and then we will take count questions from the audience if there are any. Mayor Barnett, I move that the council adopt an ordinance adopting the fiscal year 2020 budget in lieu of passage of an appropriation ordinance as presented. Second. Okay, are there any questions or comments from the audience relative to our 2020 budget? This is a subject we've been talking about for quite some time. Um, it, it's a, we've had six or so meetings, I think, at least on the budget, plus it sort of starts with our long-range planning process. So it should be old news in some way. Okay, are there any council questions or comments? Marge? Yeah, I just want to note that I will be voting no on this budget. Um, I stated right from the beginning that I thought that we should be levying zero to um, the homeowners for operations. Um, that's about $170,000, which in a budget of our scope, I feel could be made up someplace else. I feel it's a rounding error. Um, I've been disagreed with, and that's the way this goes. And, um, but, I, but I have the um, uh, feeling that this is, this is not the way to be going about it. We don't need to collect, uh, collect these tax dollars. I feel that we would be able to make them up by the end of the year. So I don't feel we should be burdening homeowners with it. Um, that's my personal belief. And so I will vote no on this budget. Thank you, Marge. Any other questions, comments from council? Greg? Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> Excuse me. I just want to thank staff again for uh, all the work that went into this. Uh, it's easy to see uh, the uh, evolution of the budget over the period of the last 10, 12 years and why the village consistently wins budgeting awards. This is a, a document that is much easier to understand, lays everything out clearly and concisely. Uh, I will be supporting the budget. Um, I believe that our streak of um, eight consecutive years of no property tax increases was improbable and very impressive, but at some point it has to come to an end. Um, as I said once before, the only revenue source that the village can actually count on 100% uh, is the property tax. It's not levied lightly. We understand what it means. Uh, but at the same time, we have a number of priorities, and we've heard from residents time and again through the budgeting process uh, about additional priorities. We're hearing more about uh, environmental sustainability uh, week after week, month after month from many, many residents. Uh, we have serious problems to fix with our facilities, with our enterprise uh, software, with any number of other uh, items. And we have $21 million worth of infrastructure in this budget, um, other capital improvements, and we have uh, ISO 1 uh, fire department and a uh, CALEA gold certified police department uh, to maintain, and those all take 
uh, dollars and cents. And those are tremendous assets to our community, and we have to continue to invest in them. So I look forward to voting for this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Other comments? Rich? Yeah, I will also be supporting the budget. Uh, I think after eight years of being flat, if we had allowed uh, an increase uh, just with inflation, it would have gone from $6 million to $7 million. So um, even keeping it flat, not taking into consideration inflation means we've had a reduction. Along with that, we've had a reduction of 70.43 uh, full-time equivalents. Those were real people who used to work for the village uh, that don't. And um, just the increase of two individuals would, uh, would pretty much utilize all of this uh, amount. Also, there's certain amounts in the budget uh, that may come in from the state of Illinois uh, through various uh, programs. However, those aren't guaranteed. If we're fortunate enough that uh, those things do come in and this $175,000 becomes uh, excess, just like you've seen other abatements, we would either have the opportunity to abate that back to the taxpayers after we have uh, real figures in front of us, or uh, with big things on the agenda like uh, new facilities, police station, and the replacement for this uh, building, we could put that $175,000 as an additional down payment, which means we would not have to borrow uh, and pay interest on that $175,000. Um, I don't like having a tax uh, increase. I think it's, it's modest. Um, the staff works uh, in a responsible and frugal way. I would assume that they're going to continue doing that, and uh, and then hopefully we'll have uh, a great outcome for our community. Thank you, Rich. Anyone else? Okay. Um, before we vote, I I got just one comment. I was asked tonight by the scouts, "What's the hardest decision I ever had to make up here?" Um, and. There's all the one-offs through the course of the year that, that you certainly see and read about in, in the press or on social media, but this is really the hard one. Um, and, and I want to assure everybody that the seven folks sitting up here and our staff, we take this really seriously. There's a, there's a huge level of transparency. If you have any questions, please visit our website and dig around. Um, it's all there for you. Um, but whether this budget is something that we all agree on in the moment or not, rest assured, everyone up here has diligently and really thoughtfully tried to process the information needed to make these decisions. Um, there's seven of us on purpose because we won't always agree. Um, but it is the one thing that is hard because there are absolutely more demands and more requirements or more demands for required services than we have resources for. So every budget that's ever passed by this village council or the other ones prior is an exercise in prioritization. It's an exercise in balancing needs and wants um, and resources, and, and none of us take that lightly. So I, I appreciate all the work my colleagues have done on it uh, and our staff, and I'd also encourage those of interest that are interested in the public to dig around our website. There's a lot of information there, and I think you'll see, whether you agree with it or not, that it's, uh, it's very well thought out, and there's a lot of, uh, it's not something that's taken lightly. So with that, April, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Wallace? Aye. Commissioner Gray? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Earl? Nay. Mayor Barnett? Aye. Motion passes 5 to 1. And that ends our active agenda. We are on to our first reading part of the meeting tonight. Um, and this part of the meeting will go through a variety of subjects. After each one of those, we'll have a little council discussion and we'll invite audience questions and comments on each of those items as we go. <coughs> this list of subjects will not be voted on this evening. So with that, Dave? Thank you, Mayor Barnett. There are so many items on tonight's first <laughs> reading agenda. But I will tell you that items F is in Frank through V is in Victor have already all been presented as part of the public hearing. So we will not be representing them again tonight, which leaves us just a handful of items on tonight's first reading agenda. Uh, so we'll start with item A, which is uh, the purchase of vehicles pursuant to the 2020 budget, which was just approved. Here to present background information on this item is our public works director, Nan Newland. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I have one item to present tonight, which is a motion authorizing the purchase of 15 replacement vehicles for the village for the year 2020 for a total cost of $1,376,811.35. Each year we have a multi-departmental uh, team that looks at all the vehicles that the village owns. Um, this team is made up of the village manager's office, finance, public works, 
uh, the fire department as well as the police department and we evaluate the need for replacement for every vehicle in our fleet. We look at things like the useful life criteria for that individual vehicle. Uh, once it's decided that the vehicle needs to be replaced, we look at the right vehicle for the right needs that we have for that vehicle. We look at the cost and we also, also look very highly at the environmental impacts of that vehicle and how we can minimize those impacts. And I'd like to just briefly go through the vehicles we're proposing this year. Um, I'd like to highlight the police department where we have some very, um, I think we're making some great improvements as far as vehicle replacements in this area. Um, hybrid vehicle technologies has gotten to a point where we are proposing five interceptor utility hybrids which are available for the first time this in 2020. So we're very excited to add these to our fleet. We estimate a 41% improvement in fuel economy for these vehicles, um, which will result in um, between $3,500 and $5,700 in savings per vehicle each year. Um, that also results in about um, CO2 emissions reduction of about 25,000 pounds of a CO2 per vehicle per year for these vehicles. Um, we also will have improved impact protection for these vehicles. That's the uh, structure around the vehicles for the type of use that the police um, have. Um, Full-time intelligent all-wheel drive for these vehicles. And another um, technology improvement is that the batteries have been improved to a state where they, the police who do a lot of work, I mean, they're, they're, it's basically their office. Um, they'll be able to work within their vehicles using the battery without running the engines. Um, because the uh, batteries have gotten to a point where they can run all the peripherals they run, which is um, a lot, which um, is phones, um, computers, uh, all the sirens, lights, all those things will be able to run off the battery without the engines running. So that's, those are some great improvements in these vehicles, and we're looking forward to having them to our fleet. Um, in police, we're also adding a Ford Escape Hybrid as a community service officer vehicle, which is replacing a gasoline engine, with, uh, replacing with the hybrid. Moving on to public works, uh, we're replacing four of our frontline snow plows, which are, I think, around about 16 years old. Um, these are the, the plows you see out there on the road, but we have our, our big snow events. Uh, we have three 10 tons and one 5 ton vehicle we're replacing this year. Uh, we have a biodiesel skid steer loader and asphalt trailers, which is what we do for pothole patching as well as transporting asphalt in the village and a one-ton biodiesel service truck in our water division. In the fire department, we're replacing um, a training vehicle, which is a battalion chief um, of training vehicle for them. They also carry a lot of equipment with them. And we're replacing the fire public education van, um, which you see around the village um, doing a lot of public education in our schools. So this is a list. Uh, there's much more information available on, um, in the council packet about all the vehicles. Um, we, as I said, we go through an extensive analysis for all of them. We are proposing to purchase all of these through cooperative purchase agreements. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Nan. Any questions from the council on this subject? Comments or questions? Nope. Um, just one note for, for folks watching at home. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. This is we, we're talking about fund number 530, equipment replacement, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have a process, as Nan alluded to earlier, where all of our departments are sort of in a constant planning mode uh, to try and soften those curves, if you will, of replacement vehicles, um, both timing-wise and then, as, as was alluded to, the type. So that f is funded every year. And that fund goes up and down in value as expenditures like this are made. So it's not ever really a surprise. And we try and soften any particular one-year impacts of it. Uh, if you're interested and want to look at the history, if you would dig around our website at Fund 530, you'd see some more of that. Any questions from the audience? Please come up to the microphone. So, Hey, Francis, please come up to the mic. The, guy, the people at home need to be able to hear you, too. Thank you for putting up that last screen. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Please. Is, uh, Curry Motors seems to be doing a, a couple of different things here. Are they located in Downers Grove? 
I don't think Curry is. We um, do we, we have any opportunity to work right with a Ford dealer in the in the town? We pretty broadly solicit opportunities for people to. I think these are bid on, right? Uh, Curry Motors is not located in the village of Downers Grove. I don't think any of these dealers are located in the village of Downers Grove. Our purchasing policy does allow us uh, local vendor preferences. However, uh, there's broad bidding uh, uh, practices that go on with a variety of shared governments, multiple governments, and a cooperative purchasing effort. Many dealers choose not to participate in vehicle sales in that arena. Uh, we've approached Packy Web uh, to and encourage them to participate, and they have chosen not to participate in the cooperative purchasing environments. This results in the lowest overall cost for vehicle purchases. Thank you. It's always kind of a drag not to see your hometown people up there, but but that is the process. Okay, moving on then. Item B, we're very excited to present a resolution granting historic landmark designation for the property at 53. 29 Meadow Lane here to present background information on this item is our community development director Stan Popovich Good evening mayor and council members I'm not going to talk about the tax levy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you <laughs> yeah, As manager Fieldman noted this is a historic landmark petition for 5329 Meadow Lane located here in Denver Woods slightly southwest of uh, downtown Downers Grove the property here is outlined in green It's sort of on the southeast side of Meadow Lane uh, the property is a mid-century modern uh, home constructed in 1964. Uh, you can see that mid-century modern uh, here shows some brick on the base and some vertical wood siding. Uh, typically these homes have those items on there. Additionally, you can see the roof line here. It's a low-pitched gable uh, with deep overhangs, as you can tell by some of the dark shadows that are appearing in my picture. Uh, the overhangs typically protect a front entrance, uh, which is back in this location over there as well. Uh, this particular home is a good example. It provides a lot of those characteristics of a mid-century uh, modern home. Uh, the clear stories above both of the gable ends as well, too, is sort of a unique thing for a mid-century modern home as well. You can see uh, from this picture, from a spring picture, and then some architectural plans that show not much has changed on the exterior of the house. So uh, this is a good example of a mid-century modern home here in Downers Grove. The Architectural Design Review Board uh, reviewed these, this property at the November meeting. They found it met the criteria. It's over 50 years old. Uh, it was built in 1964, and it is a good mid-century modern example. Uh, if approved, this would be number 28, and I believe this would be our first mid-century modern home. If you have any questions at this time, Mayor and Council, I'd be happy to answer those for you. Thank you, Stan. Any questions or comments for Council? Any comments or questions from the audience? Please, come on up. My name is Kathy Nibel. I love this house. Of course, I've loved all the landmark houses that have come up. And I'd like to just make a side comment that I recently took a trip, a train trip on Amtrak. And the reason I took it was because I like looking out the windows. I love looking at the houses. They're just beautiful. And then it was sad to see a lot of places that haven't maintained. And these beautiful homes all boarded up. It broke my heart. But when I got back to Downers Grove, here it is. This is heaven for me. I love living in Downers Grove. Anyone who is critical should take a ride and find out what a wonderful community we have. And it's filled with people like Mr. and Mrs. Mokel, who decided they wanted to make this house. They were going to create it. And they, it's a beautiful house in the Denburn Woods. If you're a walker or a bike rider, this is something to check out when you're on your rides. And we'd also like to take an opportunity just to say thank the Mokels for their wonderful hardware store. Oh my gosh, do I miss that store. And we'd also like to thank the Tricanos who have taken the maintenance and the stewardship that, that was created and now they, they are the current owners and they're doing a wonderful job. And by stepping up and landmarking their home, they are giving a gift to our children and our grandchildren that homes as beautiful as this can be they can last forever we shouldn't get rid of them and we're delighted to have this as number 28 we're very proud thank you so much Trucanos thank you so much Mokos you're both good families we appreciate it 
Thank you. Oh, I'm with the Friends of the Edwards House, and <laughs> I know the girls were able to help the family do their steps, and of course, the uh, staff too. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. The others? I'm Chuck Holtzen, 5226 Carpenter Street, and I just want to say that I support this landmark. I think it's awesome that we have the Mid-Century Modern home being put up for landmarking. Thank you. Good evening, Amy Gaston, 5320 Benton Avenue. I just want to thank the homeowners of Chicanos for making the decision to landmark their home. It's great to see another architectural style being added to our growing collection of landmark buildings, um, and I fully support this designation. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Christine Martin, uh, Maple Avenue, uh, Friends of the Edwards House. and. Uh, Friends of the Edwards House has worked with the Tricanos and the Mokels to landmark the home and we want to thank them and village staff uh, for putting the presentation together and helping us work through it. Uh, it's been a pleasure meeting the Mokels and I would like to say to Mrs. Mokel that she had such vision in the beautiful home that she created. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all uh, for your participation in this. Uh, Tricanos, thank you. Uh, it's nice to see the locals here. Uh, in particular, though, one thing I heard there that um, was awesome, at least from my perspective, was the comment, I think, Kathy, you made it about helping Friends of the Edwards House, helping with the process. And, and that's, a, that's an important thing. It, it is a, um, it's a good thing for our community when we do this, but it's an even better thing when folks help people do it. Uh, because the, it's, it's not terribly difficult, but there's still a process to work through. And I, I know our staff, is wanting to be as helpful as possible, but at some point somebody has to sort of get over the edge. And, and so thank you to the Friends of the Edwards House for helping facilitate that. Rich? Um, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I'm very interested in all these landmarks, but this home uh, holds a very special place in my heart. Uh, I've known the Mokel family and been friends with uh, uh, Linda Mokel, their second oldest daughter, since I was 12 years old. And the Mokels were gracious enough to uh, host a surprise birthday party for my twin brother and myself in this home when it was just a year old, uh, when I was 14 years old. Uh, it was an eighth grade birthday party. So I've been in this home many times. It's delightful to see that uh, it hasn't been changed. And uh, you know that it, uh, there's no reason this house shouldn't be around for another 100 years. So God bless you guys. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. OK, moving on, please. Thank you, Mayor. Items C, D, and E will be presented together tonight. We generally refer to these as budget implementation items. And our finance director, Judy Butney, is here to provide a little bit of background information on these items. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Now that the budget is hot off the presses, we have these three budget implementation items to present, as Dave mentioned. The first one is the proposed increase to the stormwater utility fee, which is increasing 8.7% from $12.40 to $13.48 per ERU. This change will be effective January 1st of 2020. This proposed increase is consistent with the 2020 budget and the stormwater plan. And for the average household, this will have an impact of $12.96 per year. The second item is the proposed increase to water rates which will increase water revenues by 4.6%. This would increase the charge for the consumption of water from $6.10 to $6.33 per unit. The increase would be effective July 1st of 2020. This proposed increase is also consistent with the 2020 budget and the 2019 water rate study. The third item is the proposed compensation plan this is for the annual, judge, uh, annual adjustment of ranges within the compensation plan, which is also consistent with the 2020 budget. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Judy. Any questions or comments from the council? Okay, questions from the audience on stormwater rates, water rates, and compensation plan. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And as previously stated, the remainder of the items have to do with the 2019 tax levy and have been previously presented. So therefore, that ends our first reading. Let's put you right back on the hook with the manager's report. I just wanted to thank the village council for the policy direction related to the budget. Uh, clear direction that started with meaningful debate and policy discussion back in the summer months, which carried through to tonight. We definitely appreciate the council's forthright. Uh, directives that make our jobs quite a bit easier. So thank you to the Village Council for your direction. It was an enjoyable budgeting process. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney's report. Thank you, Mayor. This Should we all sit back, report. put our feet up? <laughs> yes. It's actually the one time a year that I actually get to present my report visually. So <laughs> on the screens is my attorney's report. For this there are 19 <laughs> items on my report tonight. All of which will be on next week. Yeah, that's all I have. Wow, that, that's kind of wimping out. A little bit, a little bit of wimping out. <laughs> no pictures. <laughs> Although I believe next, next week, next Commissioner Jose may have the uh, privilege of reading many of those into the mm -hmm. right. But I have to start warming up. Right <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Enza. It is, um, it is a little bit tongue in cheek, of course, and, and as Dave mentioned, Greg's going to have to read all this stuff next week. The process can be a little bit confusing with this whole levy and abatement process, but it is, in fact, designed to improve transparency and, and allow folks to understand exactly what we're doing. So if you have any questions between now and next week or thereafter, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and ask. We'll be happy to explain it further. It is all also available on the website. And so with that, that ends our first reading. Our manager report, attorney's report, so it's just up to the council. Do we have any council member reports that they want to issue or talk about things going on in the community. Rich, we'll start with you this time. Uh, no report, Mayor. Nicole? I do have a report, Mayor. Just briefly, and well, actually, it's not, it's kind of brief. I'm going to be as brief as possible, but playing off of the proclamation uh, that the mayor read earlier tonight that it is Giving Tuesday, um, we still have time. It is still Tuesday. So if you have not given anything today, please consider doing that. There are many health benefits to giving. It releases some feel-good chemicals like endorphins and, uh, endorphins and serotonin, lowers blood pressure, lowers stress and depression, promotes social connections and gratitude. Um, Facebook, if you are a social media person, is matching up to $7 million in eligible donations to any United States 501 uh, 501k3 nonprofit eligible to receive donations, um, some local donations that you may want to consider. Bonfield Express Foundation, Community Adult Day Center, District 58 Foundation, District 99 Foundation, Dive Heart Foundation, Downers Grove Public Library Foundation, Hope's Front Door, Noah's Hope, Hope for Bridget, the Grove Foundation, Pads Shelter, People's Resource Center, Rotary Club of Downers Grove, Sharing Connections, C Spar, Watts of Love, West Suburban Community Pantry, which is where my family and I donated today, West Suburban Humane Society, Ind Indian Boundary YMCA. We have so many great places in town that you could give, um, whether it be monetary or food or otherwise. And givingdupage.org has even more organizations. So we've got a couple more hours in Tuesday. If you haven't done that yet, please consider doing so. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, but, uh, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, prior to the Thanksgiving holiday, it was neat to see the Village of Downers Grove kind of highlighted in one of the major publications uh, in our area. Uh, Crane Communications had, a, um, uh, had an article the week of November 24th that talked about downtown rents. Uh, downtown rents have companies taking a second look at the suburbs. And in that article, they highlighted the Crown Castle uh, cellular tower builders that chose our area over a Chicago location that they were previously looking at. And I think when you see those kinds of things pop up, it kind of makes you uh, feel a little warm and fuzzy about where you have chosen to live, work, and play that these major places have, are choosing, and I believe will continue to choose areas like Downers Grove as the shift kind of goes back from the downtown to the suburbs. With that said, the Downers Grove Economic Development Corporation is having their holiday party this week. If I'm not mistaken, it's Thursday, November the 5th. 
and it's taking place from 4.30 to 6.30. So if you are interested in just getting to know some of the individuals that are a part of that that make, makes these things happen, or you just have an addiction to holiday parties and need to get out of the house, we invite you to come out uh, 4.30 to 6.30 at the Downers Grove Economic Development Office on local. Thank you. You want to check that date? Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> December the 5th. I'm, I'm way ahead of myself, but thank you, Francis. Thank you, Kevin. Right. Barge? Another way to give back to your community is to shop locally. Um, and since it's the season of shopping, um, shop locally, eat locally, celebrate locally, and then as you're going home from your celebra celebrations, please use a designated driver or, or call a cab. Just be very careful. We'd like to start and end the year with more residents than we, we go into the holiday season with. We'd like to end with more residents than um, less residents. So be careful out there and um, and have a good time too. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to uh, join in uh, the uh, suggestion that folks take part in Giving Tuesday. I also want to uh, thank everybody who uh, braved the cold and came out to the uh, village uh, holiday tree lighting ceremony. Uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, I want to thank the Cavanaugh family who uh, donated the tree. It's huge and magnificent. Uh, it's got about a thousand ornaments on it from uh, kids throughout the community. And uh, I don't know how many lights, but it's quite a few. Um, I also want to thank especially uh, Commissioner Wallace who uh, was called up unexpectedly uh, to help us uh, sing We Wish You a Merry Christmas. And it's a very good thing because even without a cold, I'm not one to be <laughs> anybody in song. So uh, many thanks uh, to Commissioner Wallace especially. For that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Greg. With that, I have no report. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you all.